President Trump has signed into law the CARES Act, which stands for Coronavirus Aid, Relief, and Economic Security, which is the largest stimulus bill in the history of the country in an effort to combat the coronavirus and the harmful effects that it's had on our country, many of which aren't explicitly health-related. So we will go over what is in the act, why it's there, and what we can all expect moving forward in the midst of this global pandemic. So do stay tuned. John Doyle in. Heck off, Kami. Hello there, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Heck Off, Kami. I'm excited for this week. I already know what the next video is going to be after this. We've got two very important things to cover this week. Of course, we must talk about the largest stimulus bill in the history of the country. But of course, as a cultural commentator, I would be remiss if I failed to address one of the biggest developments as of late, which is that the girlfriend of a particular e-celeb has started using her boyfriend's platform to sell sexually revealing photos of herself, and he's like, totally okay with it. This is out of left field. To quote a friend of mine, we did not anticipate this, so... We will have to address that later in the week. I tweeted about it. You guys made it clear that you guys wanted to talk about the boring stimulus bill first, so we will address that. But first, speaking of the global pandemic, guess who raised over $1,000 for Direct Relief, which is a charity that provides medical support to combat the coronavirus in the United States? Any guesses? Was it the Young Turks? Was it John Oliver? No, it was us. It was the heck off commie community. It was the residents of the ISR of Hawk. Very excited about that. I will post the receipt of the donation once it processes, and it might not seem like a lot, but anything helps, and we can say that we did our part, which is epic. But anyways, on to the bill. So, on Friday, President Trump signed into law the CARES Act, which is meant to mitigate the worst effects of the coronavirus on the economy, and it's going to inject a bunch of cash into the economy and make it available to Americans and businesses who are suffering the effects of the economy basically tanking, and it's, of course, the largest stimulus bill ever crafted and passed in the history of the country, and it's going to send checks to millions of Americans and expand state unemployment benefits by adding six hundred dollars per week, which coincides with the dramatic spike in unemployment claims last week, a record breaking 3.3 million people filed for unemployment, for example. So um, before we get into the specifics of what else the bill does, it's also important to note that Donald Trump has said that he has confidence in a, quote, tremendous rebound for the economy once the pandemic is taken care of. And he's right about that. I mean, there's no reason to expect otherwise. If you look at what's happening now, as far as the absolute or cumulative effect of it, along with its trajectory, a lot of people are drawing parallels between it and the Great Depression. And if you look at what caused the Great Depression, Depression, for example, it was bad monetary policy. You know, you're going to be taught, of course, in your U.S. history classes that it was the fault of capitalism and it could only be saved by Keynesian economics, but that's not true. Milton Friedman won a Nobel Prize in 1976, partially for proving that the cause of the Depression was bad monetary policy, a.k.a. it's the fault of the Federal Reserve, a.k.a. it's time to go Ron Paul mode. Basically, I mean, the Fed had allowed for the money supply to balloon during the late 1920s. It piled up in the stock market as a bubble, and then it panicked, miscalculated, and let it collapse by a third by 1933, which deprived the economy of the liquidity that it required to breathe. And, you know, the left is going to tell you uh, that the Depression was cured by Keynesian economics and FDR, and that's not true. FDR's policies have been proved to have actually prolonged the Depression by, like, seven years. But the point being that depressions caused by bad policy, whether it's the Great Depression or the 2008 crisis, are harder to rebound from than depressions caused by externalities such as a communist virus. And this is not to say that we're going to hop right back on track, because remember, we were experiencing the longest bull market in the history of the country. Correction was inevitable. But the point is, is that the bill presupposes that this downturn is being caused by the virus, which is true. Not that it was caused by destabilization through bad policy. So once the virus goes away, we can kind of expect things to get under control. We have good reason to believe that things are going to get back on track. Not overnight, obviously but relatively quickly. And speaking of Keynesian economics, I don't believe that this bill is exactly Keynesian in nature. For those unfamiliar, Keynesian economics are macroeconomic theories that basically say that short-run economic output, especially during recessions, is strongly influenced by the aggregate demand of the economy. So this would be reflected through the fiscal policy of the government, and part of that could be things like a tax cut to give people more disposable cash. But that could also be something like a public works project, you know, operating under the guise of, well, let's just create a job for someone, pay them for it, and then they'll have money to spend. So we're not going to compare the Keynesian approach to the free market approach here, but I will say that this bill isn't explicitly Keynesian. I know the objections, I get that, but when you think of Keynesian economics, the idea is effectively that the government will spend its way out of a recession, it will give people money and they'll run wild with it, and that's not really what we're seeing here. What we're seeing here reminds me much more of like um, an eminent domain case, which is a separate issue, but the principle is sort of the same because you've got the government basically saying, hey, you got to stay at home, we're closing all these businesses, but we'll give you this arbitrary amount of money so it doesn't suck so bad. 
See what I mean? So like Keynesian economics would be operating under the assumption that people would have places to spend that money. And obviously, you know, people can still find places to spend the money. But really, the point here is to provide social insurance to the people until the true cause of this, the coronavirus, is under control and things start to get back to normal. It's trying to make it easier for people to stay at home and be socially distanced to help mitigate the virus because... If it gets worse, the economy will get worse too. So it's a matter of trying to balance the risk of the economy getting directly worse from the virus and the risk of the economy getting worse because of the reactionary mandates to the virus. So because of that, I wouldn't call it orthodox Keynesian economics. But moving on uh, to exactly what's in the bill, there's a helpful little graphic that I actually found to visualize exactly where the money is going and the different allocative proportions. It's going to get boring for a second while we list everything, but it's important so we can understand exactly what everything is for. So we'll go most to least, starting with the estimated 500 60 billion to individuals. So the point of this is to try to keep people afloat, to keep them engaged with the economy. So that means many people will receive direct cash payments, but you've also got expanded unemployment benefits um, and new rules for filing taxes and making retirement contributions, stuff like that. So most people making less than $75,000 a year can expect a one-time cash payment of 1,200 Trump bucks. Married couples would each get a check plus an additional 500 per child. So a family of four earning less than $150,000 a year can expect to get 3,400 Trump bucks since the cap is 75,000 for individuals times two for a married couple is 150,000. So anything less than that would get you the full benefits. That's 1,200 times two is 2,400 plus 500 per child. Married couple plus two kids is the family of four. That is 1,000 plus the 2,400, bringing us to a total of 3,400 Trump bucks. Now, if you're making more than 75,000 as an individual or more than 150,000 as a family, your benefits start to diminish as you get higher in income. And if you're above 99,000 as an individual or 198,000 as a family, you get no Trump bucks, you get nothing, you lose! Good day, sir! But the cash payments are based on either your 2018 or 2019 tax records, which I think is cool. Or if those don't exist, you can go through the information of the Social Security Administration. So from there, we get into the extra unemployment benefits. And that increases not only the amount of benefits, but also it expands who's eligible to collect them. And that's going to look like an extra 600 Trump bucks from the federal government on top of whatever the base amount is for someone receiving money from the state. So if you're already getting $400 a month, that will increase to 1,000 Trump bucks a month. And I understand that the conversion between Trump bucks and U.S. dollars might be a bit confusing, but try to follow along. But this boosted payment will last for four months in addition to it adding 13 weeks of unemployment insurance and people nearing the maximum amount allowed by their state already would get an extension on that. So there are also protections for gig workers and freelancers who typically can't apply for unemployment. So this will help them mitigate the consequences of lost work as a result of the pandemic. And then you've also got the tax deadline being extended to July 15th and to guarantee that you will still receive a tax refund if you are owed one by the government. So then we've also got coverage for students, basically that employers can provide up to uh, $5,250 in tax-free student loan repayment benefits, which means that an employer could contribute to loan payments and workers wouldn't have to include that money as income. And then finally, insurance coverage, which basically says that all private insurance uh, plans have to cover coronavirus treatments and vaccines. And it may makes all coronavirus testing free. So that's essentially everything for individuals. From there, we've got 500 billion for big businesses in the form of loans and other cash that they will have to pay back. And they'll also be subject to other public disclosures. But firstly, it prevents the president, his cabinet, any members of Congress or any of their immediate family members from benefiting from this money in any businesses with which they are involved. It also bans any company um, who is receiving a loan under this program from making stock buybacks for the term of the loan plus one year. So if the loan is for 10 years, you're going to have to wait 11 years to start to buy your company stock back, basically. So, and then you're also going to have to disclose all loans, the terms of them, and any other investments or assistance provided by the government uh, to the public. So, then there's also 58 billion for the airlines. One portion of that money is set aside to help cover employee wages, salaries, benefits, stuff like that. Divided up as up to 25 billion for passenger air carriers, up to 4 billion for cargo air carriers, and up to 3 billion for airline contractors. And this bill also establishes a fully refundable tax credit for businesses of all sizes that are closed or distressed to help them keep workers on the payroll. So, the goal of this is to get those employees hired back or put on paid leave to make sure that they have jobs to return to. And the credit covers up to 50% of payroll on the first $10,000 of compensation, including health benefits for each employee. And specifically for employers with more than 100 full-time employees, the credit is for wages paid to employees when they are not providing services because of the coronavirus. Also, eligible employers with 100 or fewer full-time employees could use the deduction even if they aren't closed. After that, we have small businesses, which are businesses with 500 or fewer employees at about $377 billion. And these are basically emergency grants and a forgivable loan program. And there are also changes to rules for expenses and deductions meant to make it easier for companies to keep employees on the payroll and stay open in the short run. 
It provides $10 billion for grants of up to $10,000 to provide emergency funds for small businesses to cover immediate operating costs. The forgivable loans are basically that. There's $350 billion allocated for the Small Business Administration to provide loans of up to $10 million per business and any portion of that loan used to maintain payroll, keep workers on the books, or pay for rent, mortgage, and existing debt could be forgiven, provided that workers stay employed through the end of June. And finally, there's relief for existing loans, basically that there's $17 billion to cover six months of payments for small businesses already using SBA loans. For state and local governments, it's about $340 billion, and that's for programs that will go towards specific coronavirus response efforts, including $150 billion in direct aid for those state and local governments running out of cash because of a high number of cases. And it also includes $5 billion for community development block grants, $13 billion for K-12 schools, $14 billion for higher education, and $5.3 billion for programs um, for children and families, including immediate assistance to child care centers. And then there's public health at about $154 billion to help with the influx of cases. And there's $100 billion for hospitals that are responding to coronavirus, $1.32 billion in immediate additional funding for community centers that provide health care services uh, for roughly 28 million people. 11 billion for diagnostics, treatments, and vaccines, and also 80 million for the FDA to prioritize and expedite approval of new drugs. Uh, the CDC and response efforts get 4.3 billion. There's 20 billion set aside for just veterans' health care. 16 billion to the strategic national stockpile to increase availability of equipment, including ventilators and masks. And it also boosts hiring for vital health care jobs during the crisis and speeds up the development of a vaccine, treatments, and diagnostics. And lastly, it reauthorizes a telehealth program, which just extends the reach of virtual doctor's appointments. And then for education. Education. It's about $44 billion. It's meant to provide relief to college students and graduates with outstanding federal student loan debt. So you've got the temporary student loan relief, um, which is that all loan and interest payments would be deferred through September 30th without penalty to the borrower for all federally owned student loans. And then you've got work study funds, which allows schools to turn unused work study funds into supplemental grants and continue paying work study wages while schools are suspended. And then students who drop out of school as a result of the coronavirus wouldn't have that time away from school deducted from their lifetime limits on subsidized loans um, and Pell Grant eligibility. And then they would also not be asked to pay back any grants or other aid that they've already received. Lastly, there's a bunch of institutions getting funding, including universities, art programs, Etc. Of course, the Kennedy Center. Of course, the Kennedy Center had to get twenty-five million dollars. They had to stay open. They had to stay open so they could remember to stop paying people, right? And then lastly, you've got the safety net, which is about twenty-six billion, and that's got child nutrition. So there's like eight point eight billion to give schools more flexibility to provide meals for their students. Also, fifteen point five billion going to SNAP, and that money will help cover the expected cost of new applications to the program as a result of the coronavirus. And then there's also four hundred fifty million more for food banks and other community food distribution programs. So that's basically it. Glad we got through it. That, of course, was not the first draft of the legislation. There was inevitably a lot of petty wish list type of provisions that we were forced to get through. For example, the Democrats tried to use this to expand the Hyde Amendment to allow for taxpayer dollars to finance abortions. They tried to impose certain environmental regulations, basically copied and pasted from parts of the Green New Deal. Of course, all very important for combating the virus, but those were shut down, although we did end up getting $350 million for refugees and migrants because nothing says serving the American people, like giving their money to non-Americans during a time of crisis. And that's the thing. They can't just serve the American people. They have to try and score political points. They can never just let a crisis go to waste, right? It always has to work in their favor politically. It always has to serve the ends of advancing their agenda. And finally, we were able to whittle it down to being relatively bipartisan, but you still had people like Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez literally throwing a temper tantrum over the contents of this bill, despite virtually every Democrat in the Senate voting in favor of it. It passed 96 to zero, but she chose to attack Republicans because of the contents of the bill because of the corporate bailouts. And there was another woman who was acting hysterically by the name of Haley Stevens. She's a representative from Michigan who represents a district with which I am familiar and which leans red. Wouldn't it be a shame, given that she's an incoherent, hysterical, low IQ, uncharismatic person, wouldn't it be a shame if a young, high IQ, high energy individual made moves to unseat her? Wouldn't that be a shame? They would have one less person performing for them because that's really all it is. When you've got these people having meltdowns in Congress, it's like, okay, wow, Nice performance. Wow. Wow. You're so impassioned. You're, you're, you're like a hero or something, aren't you? But I'm really not too upset about this bill. Again, it's not really a stimulus. It's more of relief until the underlying problem can be solved. And of course, we're trying to get the timing right between containing the virus and reopening the economy so people can start to get back to work. The situation will inevitably change again. But I think that it was good that something was done because if he hadn't cooperated and reached a compromise with them for coronavirus, you know, to move towards handling it, 
his chances of re-election would basically be down the drain. If he had done nothing or if he had delayed it, they would have hated him for it. I mean, granted, they're always going to hate him. Like the media is, of course, going to continue to blame Trump for this. But the point is that when the voters see that what they're saying isn't true, they're seeing that he's actually handling it. The relief checks have his name on them. The Trump bucks, that helps him. And his approval rating reflects that not only with his handling of the virus, but his approval rating in general. And since the whole global pandemic was China's fault in the first place, my guy has even said that he's not going to rule out consequences for China. Since, you know, not only was it their fault, but they deliberately spread misinformation about it, which led to its escalation on a global scale. And with this bill, I know a lot of the more libertarian types are unhappy about it. A lot of the libertarians who think that they're conservatives are upset about it. Here's the thing. And people that are skeptical of government tend to be skeptical in general. So anytime I say anything that isn't explicitly anti-government, I get people accusing me of being an agent of the state. John Doyle's controlled opposition. So let me emphasize, I'm right there with you. However... If individuals were left to their own actions, they would most likely further transmit this virus without even knowing it due to the nature of the disease, due to its incubation period or cases where people are asymptomatic. And because of that, our government, which exists in part to protect the American people, is doing exactly that based on the best available facts, modeling, and prior experience with similar viruses, etc. And I've got good news for you because while this health crisis is a collective problem that requires temporary, short-lived collectivist responses, guess what? The emphasis is on temporary. The emphasis is on short-lived. When the virus recedes, all of our lives are going to go back to normal like they were before the virus. I promise you. Don't get me wrong. Like, keep being skeptical. Like, that's important. I'm just trying to communicate that this is not the opening, like, this is not opening the doors for tyranny or some authoritarian state like China. China, for example, is probably going to be using this to rationalize the implementation of more government technology to monitor individuals and invade their privacy. And I don't think that we have to worry about that here, partially because they already do that to us, um, but also because we're not China. We're different. Like that being said, of course, we should resist any attempts at overreach or extending restrictions longer than necessary. I've been very happy, though with the way that this has been handled so far. And we can't pretend like this is unprecedented. Like several times in our history, presidents have suspended civil, li uh, civil liberties. I mean, John Adams, uh, Alien, Sedition Acts, Lincoln uh, was suspending habeas corpus, uh, FDR with the internment camps, Wilson with the First Amendment. I mean, these aren't necessarily good. I'm just saying that, you know, this isn't going to be what takes your rights away. Like those were all temporary. The historical record proves that your rights will not be taken away by drastic action like this because that'd be too obvious. I mean, look how look how aware of it you are. Look how angry about it you are. No, history proves that your rights will be gradually chipped away at until you finally wake up and realize the absolute state of your rights now versus 60 years ago and you wonder what happened. A lot of times conservatives like to preach about the wealth of nations and Adam Smith. But interestingly enough, Adam Smith's favorite book that he wrote was written earlier. It was titled The Theory of Moral Sentiments and it clearly... Well, it dealt largely with emphasizing the importance of community values that strengthen the common good. And an externality such as a virus, by definition, warrants some form of intervention for the common good. And our government pursuing the common good does not mean that all of a sudden we're collectivists who are hell-bent on reducing individual freedoms. You know, we have to seriously consider what we think the role of government should be as conservatives, and we have to seriously consider what we think our role as people or neighbors or countrymen should be. Because, you know, just because we have respect for God-given rights doesn't mean that we shouldn't care about our neighbors. I don't want you to do something that harms you. I don't want you to do something that isn't good for you. So stay home for a little while, you know, enjoy the quarantine, wash your hands. We're going to get through this. It's going to be fine. Hey guys, if you like this video, leave it a thumbs up and a comment with your thoughts. Also be sure to subscribe to the channel and turn on notifications because big tech doesn't like us. Also share the video with your friends. Shh, it's listening. Shh, my phone, wherever I left it is listening. Shh. I have a TV right there that I use as a monitor for when I do live shows. It's probably also listening. Remember the vault leaks from the CIA? I remember. The public forgot. Shh. Thank you so much for watching, and may God bless America.